Hi, welcome to Steve Rates True Crime Interviews. Delighted to be joined by my good friend, Sean Atwood, and his good friend, who we spent a little bit of jail time with, Bruno. How are you, lads? Oh, absolutely fantastic. I couldn't believe it when just a few months ago, we reunited after 20 bloody years of, of being in jail together. We're talking Towers Jail, 2002, 2003, and this was where Wild Man was housed, where I was housed, Bruno was housed with Little Italy. And uh, there's, there's, there's quite a story about Little Italy because those guys took over our building from the Aryan Brotherhood. And I'd never seen anything like it before. I mean, the boss of her gang, he was outside um, giving, the, when we were asleep, he was outside smoking with the guards, giving them orders moving people around the jail. He, he put all my mates in my cell with me. <laughs> <laughs> Unbelievable. Well, Bruno, great to have you on, mate. And, um, you know, we, we do an hour on this channel. We don't we don't like to go on too long. But um, just tell us a little bit about your first impressions of, of Sean and Wildman, because two <laughs> Englishmen abroad, um, usually... Englishmen abroad in America are going to see the, you know, the sights. They're going to see the uh, the, the beauty of New York. Walk around, uh, <laughs> you know, walk walk around and go, you know, walk around Times Square, getting photographs in Little Italy. Maybe he's going having a pizza. But Sean and Wildman decided to do America in a different way. They lived the high life. They paid a high price. They ended up behind bars with you. Yes, yes, and thank you, Steve, for having me on. Sean, always good to see you, brother. Sure. And. Uh, yeah, when I first when I first met Sean, I came into our our little area there, and right away you knew he didn't belong. Uh, you could tell right away how intelligent the guy was, and how pretty much overwhelmed, um, you know, to be in an American prison and or American jail. Uh, excuse me. And uh, I just loved the guy from the minute I met him because he was so genuine. And right, Sean, I mean, he was oh, just so you. genuine and. Uh, you know, the man, the man had an air about him and uh, you knew that he was uh, all about his business and uh, he would give you the shirt off his back. That was oh, my first impression of the man. Thank you. John, from your perspective, I mean, going into an American prison, going into any prison is bad enough, but going into the UK, you're in your comfort zone. Going into an American prison must have really been, you know, must have been a, a big culture shock for you. Yeah, because from the get-go, even though there was 13 of us arrested in the first group of co-defendants, they separated me and Wildman. They had like a do not house. So he was in a different building. So I was on my own in the building that Bruno arrived at. So I was dealing with, if you're a white guy, you come under the control of the Aryan Brotherhood prison gang. These are skinheads. They've got swazis, lightning bolts, Hitler tattoos all over them. And their reward system is... To get higher up in the gang, you've got to commit acts of violence. So to be a full member, you have to murder someone. So they're constantly looking for people to beat up so they can earn their stripes. It's called putting work in to earn your political ink. So as soon as you walk through that, through that door, if you're a white boy, they send some people up to you and then they say, look, you know, they, they, they want to find out what your charges are. They explain to you what the rules are. You, you can't sit with the other races. You can't work out with the other races. I was working out with a Chicano gang member called uh, Sniper at La Victoria Gang Tempe. Oh, yeah. and, and, and the heads of the whites came out to me and uh, they're like, hey, can we have a word? Can we have a word? Wood? And I'm like, Wood is like white boy. So I'm like, I look at Sniper. He's like, yeah, go and talk to your people. So I go off with them and they're like, hey, Wood, look around the day room. I'm like, yep. Yeah. Do you see any other white boys working out with the other races? And I'm like, nope. They're like, you got a lot to learn, Wood. Now go, go and finish your workout. But, but Bruno can add to that because because the thing with Bruno and his friends, his his you know group, was they had issues because they wouldn't abide by the Aryan Brotherhood rules in the jail. This wasn't the prison system. This was the jail. It's a lot different in the prison. In the jail, it's very transitory, and you can, you, you can kind of get away with uh, more things. So they stood up to them, but a, a, a lot to do a lot to do was to do with the racial uh, discrimination. Yeah, I mean, was there a lot of that in there, Bruno? A lot of racial discrimination. I mean, I've I've seen a lot of programs 
on American prisons and the US prisons. And I've obviously watched, you know, the Banged Up Abroad program, which uh, which Sean was on. But I mean, is the big racial tensions as is depicted on these programs? Um, let me tell you something. So um, you can't even touch on the amount of stress and mental torture you have to go through being a white guy, being a Mexican guy, being a black guy. There is absolutely a line drawn where, end of story, you eat with us, you work out with us, you sleep with us, you drink with us. You can't even so much have a conversation with another race because they'll ask, well, what are you plotting? Why are you talking to this guy? Why are you doing this? Why are you doing that? And the amount of racial tension in there, you could cut it with a knife because... You know, if anybody looks weak in there or anybody looks to be as if, you know, like a simple thing like bumping into you, uh, bumping into you, Sean, if you don't say something, you say, oh, it's no problem at all. You know what I mean? Everybody looks at you like, why didn't you say something to him? You know what I mean? So it's the perception. And I touched on this in my first interview with Sean, that the perception is any type of weakness, you're done. So that's a way to keep everybody in line, in line. And it's a way to, you know, make everybody think you're bigger and better than you actually are. It's a perception. Yeah, yeah, I get, I get that. I mean, how did, you know, how did you end up in jail? If you don't mind us asking this, Bruno, what was it? Was it a, was it a serious crime? And, and how long did you get? Okay, so um, again, I was not a violent offender. Um, I was doing more along the lines of white collar crime. Uh, I was doing checks, credit cards. That was all a few of my drug addiction. And um, I was, I think I was on the run from Colorado when I ended up in Arizona. Um, I had about a nine month run there with checks and credit cards and things like that. So my first indictment carried 107 checks, about 240 grand. Uh, I was looking at, because I was a repeat offender, uh, which is on the rope program. Uh, I was looking at a lot of time. They have, they have different structures for different people. Like Sean was looking at 200 years. I think they were threatening me at first with like 60 years because of all the different felonies I had. Um, so I ended up in there. I ended up in minimum security and I was telling Sean, um, I lasted about eight minutes in the minimum security wing over at the Rango jail. You know, I walked in there and the amount of filth and, you know, everybody laying all over everybody's stuff. Somebody said something. I don't remember exactly what happened, but I ended up in towers because, you know, right away from minimum security, after I knocked the guy out, I ended up with Sean in the towers jail. So um, I ended up, I was looking at probably 60 years at first with, I had a couple of class twos. I had, a cla I had like nine class uh, four felonies for uh, theft and forgery and things like that. But I ended up with six and a half years. And after I did my restitution hearing, uh, I ended up owing like $31,000. So kind of skated away pretty easy. Just, to put, you... the, just to put this oh. into context though, Steve, mm -hmm. Bruno has done a lot of time across America, like, like decades. Okay. How do you prepare for a sentence like that, Bruno? Well, the short, you want the short answer? The short answer is you don't. <laughs> because like Sean would tell you every day you're in there and you don't know what you're facing. You know what I mean? It's, it's a mental torture that you have to go through. And then on top of it, you have to deal with all the political bullshit. So you can't, you can't prepare like Sean used to do yoga and he used to like get into that, you know, himself type thing. But when, you do something like that, people start looking at you and say, what's wrong with this guy? What the fuck is he doing in here? You know what I mean? And that'll go to another guy. And then the other guy says, yeah, let's smash him. Let's get him out of here. Am I wrong, Sean? No, any sign of weakness, they're, they're constantly looking for people to prey on. Right. So they'll exploit it. They'll try and take your commissary. You'll have to roll up. You know, the only way I was able to survive was because Bruno and his guys had my back and Wildman and my co-defendants had my back. If I'd have been on the, in there on my own, heaven help me. And it's not his fault, um, Steve. 
it's not Sean's fault. He's, you know, he's an articulate guy. He's an educated man. He's not a thug. You know what I mean? Where they'll be looking at, he gets commissary. He's got a little money. Hey, Sean, why don't you get me a couple of things on store day? You know what I mean? So when you go in there with that mindset and you got all these people in there that, you know, like-minded idiots, I'll put it, you know what I mean? It's, it's a simpleton mentality, but you can't prepare. The best you can do in there is end up talking with a few people, getting close with a few people that don't have any malice in their heart. And then, you know, you work it from there. But every day, Steve, it's a struggle, man. It's, it's not even funny. One of the happiest days of my life, in there, Steve, was when those guys invited me to start working out with them. <laughs> and, what, and, what, and how did that how did that come about then well i think again this is 20 years ago but uh, <laughs> we just you know what the mentality that people have when they're locked up again it goes back to that everything has to do with the way your way of thinking we saw sean we just you know this guy's awesome we need to we need to lift him up that's and that's the whole thing when even now when I'm working in my union job, you know what I mean? You have apprentices coming in and you got guys, I don't want to work with that guy. He doesn't know what the fuck he's doing and this and that and the other thing. I'm the guy right there picking him up and saying, come on, I'm going to teach you this. Come on, I'm going to do this. So um, we saw Sean and, and, and we saw that this guy, he just didn't belong there. You, you know what I'm saying? He truly did yeah. not belong there. And uh, we, it, we just took it from there. We just loved this guy because of the way he, he carried himself. Carried himself like he was scared. Shit, don't get don't get me wrong. We we basically all were in our certain way. You know what I'm saying, Steve? You say you watch Locked Up. I watched every one of them shows. Could you imagine going into a Dominican jail where you had a turnover when everybody moved on the floor? I, yeah. It sticks in my head, you know. Were you were padded up with somebody in there, Sean? Were you were you with yeah, Wild but, Man? But, but, okay, so Wild Man, we had a do not house. I, he couldn't be put in the same building as me. So the head of the gang, who who we'll, we'll call uh, Ro Roscoe, was his nickname in the jail. I called him Marco in in the book hard, in hard time. Hard yeah. time. Yeah, yeah. So Roscoe, who's now serving uh, life for two conspiracies for murder in Supermax Prison. He was the head of the gang, and um, he said to me, do, do I want to have you know, my co-defendants in my cell with me? I'm like, how the, how the hell can you do that? He's like, oh, you know, just, just leave it to me. Next thing, I've got Joey Crack, I've got Grady, and Wildman couldn't come in the building. So Roscoe had the guards he'd, he was working with, Bring Wild Man into our building and just spend the day with us. <laughs> it was insane. Roscoe had his girlfriend visiting him as a lawyer in the legal visit room where the guards can't even go and, and, and watch. And they were getting up to some hanky panky. <laughs> <laughs> There's always a way around things, I guess. And 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 that's you know, even even in the US jails. I mean, from from my from my um from my chats with different people over the years i think the probably the most interesting one for me was was henry hill and i, I brought henry hill to the uk um he, he did a, a tour with me and I, and I know you know the history of henry hill you know he, he had to rat his friends out to save his own neck went on to witness protection but i brought him to the uk i sat we, we did an evening with we sat and watched the film goodfellas with him uh, then he did a talk and did a q a um, and he spent a week uh, living in the Northeast with me and one of my good friends, Neil Jackson. And he told me the stories and and, and, and I was always interested in you know, how much of Goodfellas was true, Bruno. And he turned round and, on the night and he said, 95% of it. And I want what even the prison side of things. And he, and he goes, well, what do you mean? What do you mean? And I said, well, the fact that you're standing in there, you're cooking your own meals. I says, you're standing with a Stanley knife, cutting garlic. You're making spaghetti and meatballs. He goes, yeah, 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 that all happened. Is that really what 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 happens to the, the, the mafia kind of people in, in there, Bruno? Can they get away with that kind of thing, making their own meals? Maybe, maybe 20, maybe 20, 30 years ago. Uh, you got to remember, back in, back in the late 60s, early 70s, 
you know, if you had money in there, it didn't matter. You know what I'm saying? You could buy anything you want from the guards. I'm sure it was embellished to the point where, you know, everybody loves Goodfellas. I mean, me and my family sit here and, you know, how many years later we sit and quote the Goodfellas movie. You know what I mean? You talk uh, <laughs> You think I'm a funny guy? And all that, yeah, I'm the great lines. No, I'm usually a funny guy. So, <laughs> <laughs> funny story on that. Funny story on that. My brother-in-law is standing with me. He's from he's from Las Vegas. Well, he's not from Las He's from Greenpoint, Brooklyn. And I don't know if you know it, Sean, but I grew up about five miles from Kennedy Airport, which was Idlewild Airport. Wow. So, a little later in the interview, I want to get into who I worked for when I was a kid. But my brother-in-law, he actually worked at the airport for an air, uh, for an airline company. And I got to tell you, brother, the stories he used to tell me about what went on around that airport, just priceless, man. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I'm pleased to say, Sean, that Henry Hill, um, I did carry a little bit more weight in those days, but there he is. There's me and Henry. <laughs> um, it was a cracking visit. And, and he went to Neil's um, for the final night, and I got a phone call to be, you know, to go up. And he said, I'm going to cook you a meal. And I walked in to Neil's place um, and at the stove was Henry Hill slicing garlic with a, <laughs> with a Stanley knife. The pot was on the bowl. He actually made me, after, after telling us that story, made a spaghetti and meatballs wearing Iron Man pyjamas, Sean. <laughs> but it was a great meal. It tasted fantastic. And uh, I'll, not, I'll not forget him. The other thing, here's another little anecdote as well. The, the, there was a we do a thing called a pub quiz, Bruno. So you go into a pub, uh, a bar in, in England, and they'll do a quiz. Sometimes, usually on a Wednesday or a Thursday night, a quiet night to try and bring people into the bar. And right. Henry went to a quiz night with, like with us. He didn't quite understand the concept of a quiz night, which is <laughs> that you have different people in teams who write the answers down and then submit the papers. So every time there was a question that Henry knew, he'd just shout out and spoil the whole quiz for everybody. <laughs> you are a funny guy. Yeah, you are. <laughs> just, just to add something to your question to Bruno, though, Steve, how, how, how Bruno and his mates had it. So if the pod was going to get raided by the guards, they knew and we would be told to put everything away, hide your shit. And then the guards, they come in, right? They fucking, they come in with like flash grenades and they get everybody naked and they're looking in your ass crack and they're fucking trampling on your pictures and throwing all your bedding on the floor and they got dogs fucking sniffing your ass and all this shit. And then when they take all your extra stuff, the next shift, the next shift, you these guys, these guys, without the next shift, just bring it all back with extra clean bedding and towels and boxer shorts and everything. <laughs> And it got to the point where the the cell, the three of them, the three the three main little Italy uh, members were in the cell on the end of the, end of the top tier, and they ended up putting a barrier up that said "Little Italy by appointment only." <laughs> and I remember, I remember also um, oh. Hugo. Hugo was uh, he made the juice from freshly squeezed oranges, and he was oh yeah, they 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 had it like I never saw it. It was. It was just like out the movies. So the Little Italy mob really in, in Arizona prison took over Bruno by the sounds of it. Well, yeah, um, ju just our building. Um, you know, I, I, I hit on this before. Um, everything's a perception, Steve. And yeah. someone will tell you, you know, if you push back anytime, anywhere, depend, even in, in prison, jail, whatever, you know what I mean? If you're not having it, well, what's the, what's the old adage? If you can't beat them, join them, right? So, you know, we took it upon ourselves because we were sitting and talking one day and we were at a visit and we were like, you know what? I don't like what's going on around here. And, you know, Roscoe said the same thing. He's like, well, let's just take this motherfucker over and, you know, we'll do it by brute force. And I'm like, I'm in, let's do it. You know what I mean? So uh, we started, you know, um, infiltrating, you might say, you know, we would let people know as we went that, you know, nobody here is to be fucked with. We're not going to do what you're telling us to do. And if you've got a problem with that, bring it. The thing was, was that what Sean was saying, these guys knew that 
if Roscoe wanted, those cops would bring those guys straight to us or bring us there. And it's happened where me and Roscoe went over to another building. We got escorted to handle our business. Sean will tell you. I'm not lying to you. Yeah, I saw it with my own eyes. And just to put it into perspective, Dan, so the Aryan Brotherhood prison gang has a stronghold on the whole jail system and the whole prison system. The jail is very transitory, and you can get away with, with a few more things. So when Bruno said we took over the building, this was like a building that had four different pods. Each had 45 men in the pod. Their stronghold was one of those pods. And then you got two guards in like a fishbowl, like a plexiglass uh, tower, looking down on all those four pods. So when there's a dispute over who's going to be the new head of the whites, it's either settled by a fight or a white boy meeting. So our head of the whites, I can't remember why, whether he got run out or he got uh, sentenced or moved on or whatever it was. So there was a white boy meeting. So the head of their gang was Roscoe. And I've got my co-defendants who've got some numbers. They've got their numbers. And you all have to go to the white boy meeting and vote. And then there's, there were so many AB guys, you know, the skinhead guys in there. But the vote came down in favor of Roscoe. Now, when he became the head of the whites in that building, the whole atmosphere just completely changed. I never saw anything like it. There was a youngster we adopted called Sonny Slope. He was, you know, hustling the, the extra cheeses and doing people's laundry. There was kids doing like backflips off the tables in the day room. There was a hippie in there who had a diamond stuck in his ass. We called him John the Baptist. And it, it just became, it just became like this circus atmosphere of, of, of fun in this hell environment. And for Roscoe and Bruno and those guys, for their energy to take over like that and create that fun atmosphere, it, it, you know, it was it was great while it lasted. It was the best time I had in the jail, which is a weird thing to say, because this is the jail with the highest rate of death in America. National Geographic researched it when they did my Bangladesh Abroad, and they said 62 people died in there around the time I was there, over a five-year period. You even had guards murdering mentally ill prisoners. But briefly, there was a pocket, a breather, when Bruno and Roscoe took over the whites in in, uh, in, in Towers Jail back in 2002. It was, it was fantastic. It, it lasted several months. It lasted a few months, I think, yeah. Bruno, in the UK, obviously, visits, um, you know, are something that gets inmates through during that time. Um, what were visits like for you? Did, did you have them? Some prisoners prefer not to have them because they prefer to be separated from home. They'll make the odd call home, but they'd rather not see their loved ones and drag them through it. But were visits something you did? Uh, I did. And uh, I had uh, my, my daughter had just been born back in 2000. And my baby's mother would bring her up, you know, every once in a while. And I would be getting visits from different, different women, you know, here and there. But uh, as far as family members, my family members were back in New York and in Vegas and things like that. And, uh, you know, it really wasn't a big deal for me. Uh, when I had to go out to visits, uh, you know, if I didn't have anybody visiting that, me that day, uh, Roscoe would set up a visit with somebody so I could get out there and take care of business, watch his back. You know, uh, it was basically not an issue for me because, you know, I really wasn't from there. And, uh, you know, the, the little bit of visit time I had was basically just to take care of business. You know what I mean? And uh, do what we needed to do out there. Was it hard for you, Sean, being across there and not being able to get visits? Because obviously all your family were in the UK. So here's the thing, right? My girlfriend was visiting me three, oh, right. three times a week. And there was a Golden Gloves boxer that was part of their crew. And my girlfriend became friends with the Golden Gloves boxer's girlfriend. And we got extra visits. And the visits were, like, extra long because of, the, because of thanks to those guys again. So, yeah, you know, it, it was absolutely fantastic. But it, it's hard, man. It's hard. You know, the visits. It's hard it's time. Like, it's like gold. Mail is like gold. When you go back to yourself after the visit, the reality hits you. And you're usually on borrowed time with, with a girlfriend as well. Usually, in, in my case, it lasted a year or so. But a lot of guys get dear John. And some of them get so gutted that they never re recover from it. 
UK PI is asking what the food was like, Sean. <laughs> I'll, let, let, I'll let Bruno let Bruno take that one. All right. So uh, again, this guy, this this sadist that we were locked up by, prided himself in letting the public know that it cost more money to feed his dogs than it did for his inmates, and that's a and that's a fact. He would, he would have food donated. I don't think he bought anything. He would wait for the supermarkets to have, you know, rotten, spoiled food. And then he, they would donate it to him. I think the only thing that they couldn't donate was the milk because it had to be brought in every day. I, I think I'm right about that, right? So between the green bologna and the rotten cheese and the hard um, molded bread, I'm not lying about a thing. He would take the rest of that that he couldn't serve for lunch, chop it up, red death, green death. Am I right, Sean? Like red death, Kib green kibbles, death. Kibbles and bits. Kibbles and bits. <laughs> the food was atrocious, Steve. I mean, it's not for human consumption. I mean, bottom line, that stuff was garbage. He fed us garbage. I lost about two stone over the 26 months I was fighting my case. Wow. That's a lot of weight to lose. You can see it in that picture that I put up earlier. Actually, you know, you don't, you know, you, you, I've, I've met you a few times, Sean. You, you know, you're a big lad and broad, and you do a lot of training. You do your yoga. You keep yourself fit. But I mean, there, the clothes are hanging off you. <laughs> Unbelievable. Yeah, was, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Oh. Exercise, exercise. Obviously, you got to the gym with Bruno and the guys, Sean. I mean, did you keep yourself fit? I mean, you know, good friend uh, to the show, Charles you, Salvador. You, just you, press up, sit up, yeah. etc. You make the most with what you got. So your pink yeah. socks. Right. Let, 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 let me just um, paint the picture of how it was. Mm -hmm. So in, in our day room, there's a sliding door at the front where the, the guard's tower is above that. The door, then the walls fan out, and you've got two tiers of cells at the back. You've got a metal grid stairs running up the middle to the upper tier. Now, those metal grid stairs, they're like kind of transparent, so you can't be hiding behind them and, and getting up to no good. So you wrap your pink socks around the metal grid stairs, and then that's how you do your pull-ups, off the stairs like that. And then for your, your, um, your curls and your shoulder raises and stuff, you got the, the broomstick with uh, mop buckets of water on either end of it. I'll let, I'll let, and then dips and push-ups. I'll let, let Bruno um, describe some of the other workouts. So we would make water bags, and we would take the mop handle, and we'd tie water bags. We'd kind of try to get them you know, to the same weight, and we'd tie them on there, and we'd lay across the table. That's when Roscoe had his boys there, so we didn't get in trouble, right, Sean? Yeah. Lay across the table, do presses, do shoulders, do back. Take the mop bucket, do the mop bucket, and uh, you know it's uh, use what you can, man. I mean, you know, if we would have had if we would have had a couple of plastic jugs, we would have filled it up with water, put it in a laundry bag, and you know, did what we had to do. But I tell you what, the best shape I was ever in is then because it was all body work. Am I right? <laughs> There's nothing you can't lift. <laughs> and then, yeah. and then, and then, it's like we were each other at some point. Remember that with the push-ups of people on their back. Oh yeah, yeah. I mean, the hooch, the hooch in English prisons is something as well to make. I mean, alcohol. I mean, did you did you do that, Bruno? I personally didn't. Uh, I know it was around there. I I personally thought that stuff was disgusting. Um, rotten fruit, sugar, bread. You know, when you're starting off with molded bread, <laughs> and uh, God knows what, all the all the fruit was rotten too. You know, what I mean, if you got you got a good grapefruit here and there, you got lucky, you know what I mean? But that's all Sean lived on, I think. He lived on, like, grapefruits and cheese and, you know, he'd buy everybody's cheese. I was like, friggin', what are you, what are you, like a mouse? You know what I'm saying? I had to eat it fast, though, Steve. Am I right? Yeah, I had to eat the cheese fast, though. It's, it was in, like, a slice in plastic, and it was so hot. We're talking almost 50 degrees in the summer. It melted into orange juice yeah, yeah. If, you didn't, if you didn't eat it. So it's just orange oil in plastic within a couple of hours. Wow. Wild man, wild man, um, he he got involved in hooch quite heavily. And if people want to see that video on my channel, it's Wild Man's Hooch recipe. And he's also got a lot of his food recipes on the channel as well. 
Yeah. Okay. Did you ever get on the wrong side of the gods? UKPI wants to know. Bruno, we'll go to you first. Did you ever? Did you end up down the block, as you would call it, in the UK? Oh man. So yeah. Uh, at the end there, uh, I got on the bad side of this woman. Um, she just she saw me. She saw the devil, man. And I couldn't tell you how many times she tried to get rid of me. Finally, she did after. Uh, I don't remember what happened, Sean. I think I, uh, I I ended up, you know, handling a chomo or something. And right then, when I came back, she finally got me out of there. But as far as it went, our guy, I mean, he uh, he basically had those guards where he wanted us, and nobody bothered us. And uh, towards the end, like I said, you know, just you know, a good thing will never last in there because you got so many people hating on it and. You know, this woman just, I forgot her name, Sean, but this woman could not stand the sight of me, man. You remember that? Yeah, there was a verbal exchange. Right. And she sent Bruno to the LOAF program in maximum security. If, if Bruno wants to explain what that means. Well, if you, if you didn't think it could get any worse, man. Uh, so... After I got rolled down there, uh, they took me back to Madison Jail, uh, max security. They put me up on the sixth floor, and they put you on a LOAF program, which is it's called it's it, it's short for it's an acronym loss of food, and that's the worst thing that could happen to you. And even though the food was terrible, it was still you know, it was still uh, you know you eat anything when you're hungry, bro. And it was all kinds of vegetables and all kinds of just crap that they put in a blender and then they baked it in some bread. But the problem was the bread was so thick and so hard and they cooked it to the point where it was like a brick. And they, they served the tea in this white paper twice a day. And after the first couple of days, you know, you're going to start nibbling on anything. But that was probably the worst time in my life in there because I, I was starving. I was cold. I was, you know, I was being infiltrated by roaches. It was just beyond uh, mental warfare and that. What about you, Sean? Did you come on the, the wrong side of the tracks in there? Did you come a cropper with the uh, with the staff or were you, were you in a, a, an honourable prisoner, a good prisoner? So I kept myself to myself. And my lawyer told me early on, you know, the more you interact with any person or any entity, the more likely it is to harm you. So I took that with me into the jail and I just, you have minimum interaction with the staff. If you are having too much interaction with the staff, then the gang members start to think you're a snitch. Right. So it's best, you know, it's best just to stay out of harm's way. And that, that was my, my philosophy. Okay. Yeah. I, I mean, I, obviously watching some of the documentaries is great, but I've also got hooked whilst it's been on with 60 days in jail which I'm pretty sure has been shown in the US. I'm sure you've seen a bit of it, Sean. It's probably brought back some memories and some nightmares. Is that a realistic depiction of what goes on in there, Bruno, that program? You know, brother, no. I, I mean, I, I don't know, but let me, let me give it to you from my perspective. And Sean will, he'll agree with me on this. You get pulled out once, to talk to somebody. I don't care if it's a fucking, if it's a fucking TV crew or not, you get pulled out twice. That's it. That's it. There is no way in hell you're going to sit there in a meeting room with a, with a, with a blanket over it. My take on that is it's somewhat real, but I think it's staged convicts that they pull around the jail and say, Hey, there's going to be a TV show, cameras, um, you know. No, no way. I I'm sorry, Sean, tell him. There's no yeah. way you're going out to talk to the cops more than once before you smash and gone. Am I wrong? There's no way any cameras would ever get to see what's really happening in one of no those way. jails. The American public, to realize what is actually going on in their own backyard, there, there would be outcry. Now, when, when you see the boss of our jail, his name was Sheriff Joe Arpaio, prided himself on being America's toughest sheriff. And whenever you see him out on the news or on TV shows, he's like overlooking a gang of inmates in the black and white stripes, chain gang, 
They're like raking the highway. They're digging graves. And then the, the media go up and talk to them. They're like, yeah, we love Sheriff Joe Apayo. He saved my life. I'm off the drugs. My life turned around. The reality was, Steve, and, and Bruno saw this firsthand. Whenever that, that bastard walked into the jail, surrounded by the goon squad, the Ninja Turtles, like 10 of them, massive guys, I would know because the whole building would start to vibrate. They'd be like, bang, bang, bang on the toilets, bang, bang, bang on the walls. And then everyone, everyone would be yelling, hey, Sheriff, would you eat this fucking shit? Would you feed your family this fucking shit? Yeah. Blah, 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 blah. I, I, I don't know what that 60 days in, how they stage it. I mean, Sean, they were even in Tucson. Yeah. Or, not, which is, uh, uh, yeah Florence. Yeah, they were in uh, yeah. uh, mm. Pima County. Yeah, Pima County there's Jail. There's no way. There is no way that would have went on. No way. It's got to be staged. Uh, it's, it's definitely done in the jail. And I'm sure there's inmates that are already locked up. But I think everybody is pre- uh, pre-screened saying, hey, we're going to do a TV show in here. Don't hurt nobody. Don't do this. And we'll give you like a cookie. Because let me tell you something, Steve. All you got to do is offer them a cookie and they're going to testify against you. <laughs> oh, John. <laughs> One cookie and you're testifying. Are you, are, you say? are you kidding me? I'll tell you everything I know. In your, in your opinion, Sean, could they get away with that in the UK? Do you think? Do you think it would be? I mean, I never thought they'd get away with it in an American prison. I've got to be honest. And, and as each series went on, I think there's been six series. I might be wrong, but I, t I watched every single one of them. And as it's progressed, the inmates have become a lot more aware of the program because it's been televised and they've clearly seen it. And suddenly, there's a paranoia, a suspicion whenever a new inmate comes in. Is he sixty days? Is he sixty days? We saw a lot of that. Do you think anybody could? Do you think they could, they could get away with it in, in in the UK? Because I've often I've often thought I wonder whether they'll get anybody stupid enough to do it. Okay, so prisoners are extremely street smart. They're tuned into all of the body language, and anything out of the ordinary is picked up on right away. And even people who are innocent of things, if they're behaving in in a way that doesn't fit in, they get dealt with right away. And when I say dealt with, their heads are getting smashed against toilets, their teeth are getting knocked out potentially getting left for dead. It is a life and death environment. So in the UK, you know, this collective uh, street smart intelligence, I, I believe that would apply anywhere in the world. Okay, that's great. Glasgow guy wants to know, you're shaking your head, Bruno. Do you want to make a point? No, it's just not happening. I just not don't happening. see, I don't see how, you know, even after the first season, because I watched them all too, don't get me wrong. Yeah. Um, after that first season, it's already out there. So any mm. TV camera that's walking in that jail, that's it. You ain't going to talk to them. Yeah. I don't care. I don't care who you are. You could be the yeah. weakest dude or you could be the strongest dude. It's not happening. Glasgow guy wants to know why you why do you think the sentences are a lot more harsh in the USA? I mean, they are. I mean, you mentioned there 200 years that, that you know, Sean and his crew were looking at for, for their crimes. And, you know, your sentence was a lot harsher than you would get in the UK. Why, why do you think the Americans really go to town. I mean, we're already looking at, you know, we're looking at sentences being handed out to people 80 years, 100 years. There's no chance of coming out. Is that for me? or Yeah, go on, Bruno, yeah. Go for it, yeah. Uh, so this is, this is what it is. This is what it comes down to, Steve. This uh, justice system in the United States, it's all about money. Convictions and money. You understand? That's why when you go into jail, if you're any type of a criminal that has, you know, like, like I told you, the nine felonies that I was facing with all the different, that's what they do. They put as much as they can on you. Then they put you in this spot to ruminate, you know, to marinate in it. Holy shit. I better take, a, I better take a plea. That's one way to get you in the system and never let you out. You got probation, parole, uh, restitution. Like I was telling Sean in my interview with him, it took me selling my house in Arizona. I started out owing 31 grand. By the time it was all said and done, when I signed my plea agreement, I didn't know they were going to charge me 10% interest a, uh, a year. I was paying $7.99 a day. 
on that 31,000. So when I sold my house, they took 48 grand from me. You know what I mean? So my point is, is that they throw it at you so that they could drop nine of them, convict you on two of them, make you think you got away with something. In the meanwhile, if you took it to trial, you had a decent lawyer. Like he had, he had Alan Simpson, the best lawyer in Arizona at that time. You know, um, it's just, it's, again, it goes back to mental warfare, man. You want to lay in that jail for a couple of years like Sean did? Go ahead. Good luck to you. A lot of people won't. They would have been like, okay, give me life in prison. I'm going to prison. You know what I mean? Because it's just, you want to get out of there so bad. There's nothing you can do. So that's what they do to you. Yeah, I, I ended up with the lawyer that the New Mexican Mafia recommended to me. And um, Roscoe, the head of the gang, had the same lawyer. And he was a loophole lawyer. So I, I just waited it out for the 26 months in the jail. But just to add to the question then, if a prosecutor can get a 200-year sentence on you, she or he makes headline news, they're aspiring to run for the Senate or to become a judge. It's all career advancement. Yep. And there are more devious, ruthless people working in the system than are housed, you know, bigger criminals in the, in, uh, behind the system that are housed in the system. Yeah, it's fascinating, really interesting. Yeah, I've got a lot of questions that have come in um, by Twitter earlier on. Um, escape, Bruno. Did you ever think of escape? Uh, that's from Michael from Felon in Gateshead. Never. It, it's impossible, man. I mean, you know, you hear about, and Sean will tell you, I mean, you, you hear about, first of all, you got to get out of your pod. Then you got to get out of your building. Then you got to get, um, you know, thinking about escape. You know, everybody sits there and thinks, man, I wish I could just walk out the door. Man, you know, um, you have to be like, if you're in a jail, you're working in the kitchen, you got a guy that you know that's driving a garbage truck. Maybe you can get a couple of your guys to dump you in the garbage can and, you know, throw you in the back of the truck and hope for the best. But, you know, these – it's you got 16 doors you need to go through before you even get out to, a, like, a hallway. So, no, man, you're not, you're not escaping my family. I mean, am I wrong? These guys You've seen the escape from Alcatraz, Sean. I mean, we, we always love to believe. We always love to believe they got away. Um, <laughs> you ever think of escaping? Arizona guards have got an arsenal of weapons, and they will shoot you dead. And if you survive, you will get five to ten years at least added onto your sentence. So yeah, everybody fantasizes about escaping, especially when you're facing a lot of time. But that's just something to get you through the day. Most people don't actually uh, put it into play. There have been a few escape attempts in Arizona, and they've not ended very well. But there's a very a very pertinent question has, has come in um, from Don't Trip. Can you see that one about the federal prison versus the state prison, Steve? Yep, there you go. Um, there you go. If I if you had to choose, would you go to state or federal prison? Thanks for that, Don't Trip. It's night and day, and. and uh, have you been in both, Bruno? No, I've never been in federal prison, but uh, we always dream about going to the major leagues, you know what I mean? <laughs> um, you know, federal prison, uh, as there's, there's harsher sentences, there's, you know, you're going to, if you're involved with the feds, you're looking at a lot of time. And, you know, there's pros and cons to everything. But as far as that is concerned, um, I would love to have gotten the feds better food, you know, better beds from what we hear, but... You know, as far as the time you'd have to do on that little bit comfortable bed, no. no so they, they call some of the Fed prisons Club Fed because the federal government has got the most money. So the conditions are a lot better. And it's a higher class of criminals. And, and what I mean by that is it's like interstate crimes, like trafficking, bank robbery, politicians. But in the state prisons, it's like the homeless, the drug addicts, the mentally ill the gang bangers it's it's absolute fucking mayhem so it's so different the experience that the people have in the federal prisons versus the state prisons if if i had to go to a prison to serve my time i would rather have been in a federal prison 
Yeah. Okay, great stuff, great answer. Scott's asking a good question as well. He says, do you think the bail bonds will ever change or is there just so much money involved because so bail money is crazy for the crimes, unlike here where we can be on bail for over a year? That's a great question. Sean, do you want to take that one first? So my bail was initially set at um, $750,000 cash only. My lawyer, like almost a year later, we went for a bail reduction and the prosecutor... She sabotaged that hearing and the judge took it under advisement. And when his ruling came in, my bail was doubled to $1.5 million cash only. I was hoping I was going to get out. I ended up getting uh, reclassified to maximum security. <laughs> I'll, let Bruno, I'll let Bruno pick up on that. So uh, I don't know if you, if the bail system is, is the same in the United Kingdom as it is here, but this the bail system here is a big money uh conglomerate what happens is you call a bail bondsman the bail bondsman works with an insurance company that gives them power of attorneys in other words you got a 5000 10000 20000 25000 power of attorney it's a piece of paper that the insurance company they work with they give them these to where they give the bail company pretty much carte blanche on who gets out and who doesn't because they're taking all the risk. They get your family member in. Okay. It's going to be 10% of 25,000. They keep that $2,500. They go down, they hand the jail, the piece of paper, you get out. Now they're responsible for getting you back to court when you're supposed to be in court. The only time the bail bonding company loses out or starts to lose money is when you don't show up to court, then they got to go look for you. Because what they'll do is they'll call in the bond. When you don't go to court, they'll, they'll say to the bail company, okay, you got X amount of days to bring them in front of me, or you're going to give us a check for $25,000. That's the way it works. So it's it's a big money thing. That money that you paid, that 10%, you're never getting it back. Family's never going to see it. That's the, the way other that question. Works. Another question I got in from Twitter was from uh, Michael uh, Johnson, and he says, Christmas time. Uh, tell us about Christmas time in Arizona prison, Sean. Mm, man, it's the worst. Everyone's depressed because they're like reflecting that they're not with the families. They're reflecting for being such idiots, making you know making the mistakes that put them in there in the first place. And you're just really bummed out, man. I was like, oh shit, look what I put my family through. There's like a queue to get on the phone to to call your family members. The guards are, are sweating people because. People are, are trying to make extra hooch to, to get out off the faces so they're not thinking about these things. It's not a good time of the year. No, I, I, I can imagine it's not. Bruno, Christmas for you. I mean, you know, you spent a few in there. Not good at all. I tell you what, man. My, uh, my wife can answer this one for you because uh, till this day, just another day, you got to desensitize yourself to everything that's going on outside. And I get... I get shit from my whole family because they call me Scrooge. They call me this. They call me that. It's hard to get excited about some, even now that, you know, it's just another day, man. You wake up, you do nothing, you get fucked with, and then you go to sleep. So, unfortunately, I've dragged all that shit out here into, you know, into the yeah, real world. I understand. I can understand that. Kelsey wants to know, did, did, did you have any jobs in prison, Bruno? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a master electrician. So I do, uh, you know, I, was, I, I worked maintenance in prison. And, uh, you know, that was, that was an elite job because you could go everywhere on the prison yard. And, you know, whenever somebody needed something moved from here to there, I just throw it in my car or, you know, put it in my prison wallet and bring it across for them. You know what I mean? <laughs> what what was um what was it like for Wildman? What you know, obviously you know we lost him recently. He is a top top bloke, and and you know I had the pleasure of meeting him only once. Um, and and he went on, Bruno. I know you know this now because you've obviously touched base with Sean. But uh, he went on to work with Sean and and do some fantastic work on the podcast. His stories are all on Sean's channel. Make sure you subscribe to Sean's channel and and just tune in to the, some of the wonderful back catalogue that he's got. But yeah, I mean, 
just, just, just tell us. We'll come to you, Sean, first. Just give us, give us a wild man story from Arizona that you maybe haven't talked about. You know, let me let me just set the table for for a story that, that Bruno can pick up on. Then, okay. So, oh, yeah. so, so Roscoe, like I said earlier, he asked me, you know, do you want your co-defendants to move in with you? Yeah, um, Joey Crack, R.I.P. Joey Crack. He 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 died. Uh, in, I think he was in his thirties. He got out of prison. He got a new job. He was celebrating and he overdosed on drugs. But Joey Crap was a real live wire and he was a storyteller. So in our cell then, every night, Little Italy would file in. <laughs> Joey Crap <laughs> would be telling all these wild man stories because Joey Crap used to hang out <laughs> with wild men on the streets and get up to all these kind of crazy adventures with him. <laughs> and um, Little Italy was all just sat there, just, just watching watching Joey Crack. And then they asked, uh, Bruno and them asked to meet Wildman. And rather, you know, I, I've, I've described Wildman over and over. I think it would be more authentic if Bruno just describes his first impression of Wildman and, and what people in the jail thought about Wildman. Oh, it was treacherous. And, you know, for me, uh, me and him right away, we just, you know, I, I love the guy. I, you know, there was no, there was no, um, you know, oh, I'm tougher than you or whatever. This guy, you know, and I read some of the comments after we did our podcast and all I thought wild man did this. People need to shut the fuck up, man. You know what I mean? Well, I thought wild man ran this and ran that. Well, let me put it to rest right now. The guy could have ran whatever he wanted in there. You know what I'm saying? And he was just bigger than life. Whatever was on his in his head was on his was was on his mouth. You know what I mean? He would talk about whatever he needed to do, and he was all business. And anybody out there that commented last time and said I thought this and thought that, keep it to yourself because the guy was genuine and he was the real deal, man. Period. Yeah, that must be do. fantastic to hear that, Sean, because you you know you're, you're a very close friend and the respect is is obvious there from Bruno. Not so much. Yeah. I'm not. Every, Don't get it wrong. Everybody respected that man. Everybody who met Peter could see he just spoke what was on his mind. And if anyone gave him any shit, he just knocked them out. It didn't matter if you were Aryan Brotherhood. It didn't matter who the fuck he was. Even when the ABs came to him asking about his charges, he knocked one of them out. So he um, commanded the respect. And I think there was an unpredictability about him. Like, you know, from throwing communion at the priest to just dropping his trousers and mooning people, running around the building wild on, on, on hooch. Uh, he, he, was, he was very unpredictable. I think a lot of people look, looked at him as a, as a maniac. Yeah. And, yeah. A big, and a big maniac. He was 6'2", and, you know, hundreds of pounds in weight. But your podcast with Bruno, I've, I've left the two links below. I've left the two links below. What was the horseshoe? You kept going on about oh. what was what was that? I gotta tell you, brothers, I, I apologize. My niece is getting married in an hour and a half, and I'm gonna have to cut it short at an hour. But no worries. Steve, I'll I'll give you my my quick synopsis on it. But I'd love to come back and finish talking to you guys and having another story. But as far as the horseshoe went, pure hell. Uh, it was just two to three days of torture. Two to three days of you wishing that you were, you know, you were, you were dead, basically. I mean, the filth, urine, hobos, just every dreg, every dreg of society would be laying there with you and right next to you. Hey, bro, how you doing? You know what I mean? Like, guy was just in a dumpster three hours ago, and now he's my brother. You know what I mean? Am I right, Sean? Yeah, absolutely. And if you need to go, Bruno, I can, I can pick this up. And really appreciate you coming on. Just want to wish um, you all, wish you, wish you, is it your niece or your granddaughter? You say all the best. Yeah. Congratulations, congratulations on the wedding. Me, and I got the whole family standing here waiting to go to the wedding. So going like that. <laughs> <laughs> but I'd love for you guys to have me back on. I'd love to do it again. And uh, just, just a real quick note, Sean. My my most longest love and respect to you, man. You know, uh, I'm so glad we reconnected. Steve, you know, anything you need, man, just give me an email. And uh, I, I enjoyed the hell out of being on with you guys. 
Top man, thank you very much for coming on, mate. Much love and respect, Bruno. Really appreciate it, man. Cheers. Take care, mate. Cheers. God bless. Yeah, thank you, thank you. Fantastic to have him on. Thank you you so much for inviting him on. Yeah, I mean, you know, (laughs) people have have like said I've made my story up. I've only done a night in jail. Wild man's a figment of my imagination, and Bruno just came into my life and you know just filled in the bigger picture. And just to go back to the horseshoe then, the horseshoe is where you go when you're first arrested. And it's a subterranean row of cells in a horseshoe formation. You go in one side, you come out the other when you've been classified. Now, when we first arrived in the van, it was the first group of co-defendants, half women, half men. There was a queue to get in. And these are like the new arrestees, gangbangers, people high on drugs, people who have been in fights with the police. It's a pretty rowdy crowd of men. They see our women getting off the van and they start yelling. I can't remember exactly, but it's like, you know, whip women, um, get your tits out, that kind of thing. I'm watching Wildman in the van. He's watching this. Eyebrow goes up. And you know when the eyebrow goes up, he's going to do something. So the guard's yelling at everyone, get down off the, off the steps on the van. And Wildman... He just stands on the top step in his in his cuffs, black and white stripes. He's got a Viking's beard at this point. <laughs> and um, he refuses to get off the top step. He, he, he yells at all the men yelling at the women. Hey, you lot. Those women are with me. Who the fuck do you guys think you are disrespecting our women? In a, in a little bit, we're all going to be inside those cells right there. And if you don't shut the fuck up right now, I'll have all of you. And then he just went, <laughs> and the whole fucking van was shaking from him laughing. They shut, believe me, Steve, they shut the fuck up right there and then. So I was lucky again, you know, going in the horseshoe, wild man with me. People, everybody knew he was with us all, looking out for everyone. Got this big maniac. But it is, it is um, an interesting environment because it's subterranean. See, so there's no windows. You yeah. don't know whether it's day or night, but the only way you can tell whether it's day or night is, is by the feeling the wall, how hot the wall is, because you're being cooked alive in a concrete oven, basically. Like I said, it's almost 50 degrees. And then every now and then the guards come in, slide in a, a, a bag of uh, moldy bread and green bologna. And there's fights breaking out because these gangbangers, they're like street gangs. So, you know... West 27th Avenue Crips versus 19th Street Bloods and all that shit. They start, you no, know, they see each other. It's fight on sight. Then the guards come in, they drag people out and they put them in these, like, it looks like a medieval torture device called a restraint chair. So they put them in these restraint chairs, they strap them in. It's like a tilted black, black seat. And they put a spit hood on their heads. And you, as you're moving from cell to cell, you, you go past people in these restraint chairs, and some of them are like just shaking and cackling and foaming at the mouth in these restraint chairs. It's, it's, it's like an asylum. So for days, you're going through this. You see a judge. The judge, that's the one who issues you your, your bail bond. And you, then you get a charge sheet. You get fingerprinted. They take your belt off you so you can't hang yourself. They take your mugshot photos. And then by the very end of it, you strip search, they give you your black and white stripes, your pink boxes underwear, and they give you your classification. So me and Wildman in the beginning were classified to medium security, and the rest of the first group of 13 went over to uh, minimum security. And that's that's how the, the journey into um, the jail began, which is described in hard time, yeah. If you want to buy hard time, I've stuck the link below in the uh, in the description, as well as the two interviews that Sean did with Bruno. Well worth a watch. Make sure you subscribe to Sean's channel. Uh, did Sean ever experience any spooky stuff or ghosts inside, says Ray J? You know what? In some of these environments, there's, there's, there is a really spooky energy. And I, I would say in the Supermax prison, where you're housed, and there's a run just over the way, where they've got death row. So at Supermax, it's very hard to get out your cell, but they do in the middle of, like very early in the morning, they allow you to go into a handball court. This is in SMU, Florence, Arizona. And in the handball court, you can actually yell over to the other, over the wall, to the guys who are on death row. 
And I think, you know, um, hearing conversations, talking to those guys, and just being in an environment where people are getting executed, that was probably the spookiest of the whole of the whole thing, yeah. Tim Cairns wants to know, did you ever uh, have a period where you thought your time was up when you were in prison? Yeah, you know, in the, in the first year I was facing... 10 charges that carried a maximum of 10, uh, 10 years each. And they, they slapped serious drug offender status, which was 25. And then in the second year, they doubled my charges, doubled my bail bond, and I was facing a maximum 200 years. So at that point, I was planning I was planning on uh, slashing my wrists and bleeding out. I thought my life was over. And I planned to do it after a guard did a security walk. But what stopped me from doing it was, I want, before I was going to kill myself, I wanted to say goodbye to my family and friends. And what I mean by that was, I was allowed seven photos, get the photos out of my mum, dad, girlfriend, sister. And to be honest, Steve, I started crying when I looked at the, the photo of my mum, thinking, I, you know, my mum was going to get a call saying, your son's just killed himself in a foreign prison. I couldn't bear the thought of doing that. And that, that's, what, that's what prevented me from doing it. But yeah, I did think my time was up at that moment. But you get over the hump. It was very self-pitying of me. And I spoke to guys in that jail in the days after. One guy, he had hepatitis, um, syphilis, stomach cancer. He was going to die in there. And I was like, shit, you know, there's always someone worse off. And that that became a yardstick for me. And I I turned that corner. And I actually credit now being pushed to the brink of suicidal insanity with putting enough pressure on my brain to force me to go inside myself, address my demons, the root causes of what I did. And it was it was actually the beginning of me turning my life around. I didn't realize it at the time, as horrible as it was. But I needed to go through that as a person to mature. I was so emotionally mature. I think I stunted my uh my mental my age when I was when I started taking drugs. But 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 jail and prison certainly forced you to grow up fast. Okay, we always do an hour on this show. Just want to ask uh, a couple of things. What's next for Bruno? Because I know you're planning things with him. What what, do you, what have you got planned with Bruno? Honestly, Bruno is such a down-to-earth, modest guy. And we've only scratched the surface on his story and what he's been through in his life. I think people can just tell from his presence that he's been involved in some serious stuff with the families and... Um, I saw him in action as well, enforcing in the Arizona jail. He served decades in prisons. I think he's been in prisons in Arizona, Colorado, and California. He might correct that, but wherever he went, he stood up for himself and, you know, ascertained that he wasn't going to be pushed around. And I, and I seen him do that over and over uh, physically. <laughs> physically, he was very efficient at knocking people out. So he's got a hell of a life story that we've only had a glimpse of. And I, I just feel blessed that after 20 years, he's come into my life. And it was like, you know, Wild Woman came into my life at the perfect time. Bruno's come into my life. And I can't wait. Hopefully, I, you know, we can do the life stories of, of both of them as books. And speaking of books, uh, Steve, you know, I appreciate all the books that we've collaborated on together, the audio books. James, the cameraman, he's hustling some trailers up now on, on the Sayers audio books. So we should have some information uh, coming to the viewers soon on those. Fantastic. Um, Kelsey, we'll do that one on the next show because Sean and I are going to collaborate once a month with different guests and um, we're going to do we're going to do a show once a month, which is great. So we'll definitely come back to that in the next show. Um, I was going to ask you just what's coming up next on your channel. What can people look forward to on, on your channel over the next you know four to six weeks, mate? So I'm just really inspired, you know, that I've got such a fantastic job of interviewing people, speaking to interesting people like yourself, Steve. And we're just going full tilt because last year, even though we got 100,000 new subs, there were some major challenges. <laughs> my, channel, my channel was terminated twice. Hackers got control of my channel and... Uh, other things have been hacked. You know, they took my Twitter and changed it to Elon Musk's. And I also got hit with the virus. And I was down for about a month. So that November and December, pretty much, it was in the days. I couldn't really get much done. So I'm just really appreciative of my whole team stepping up to the plate. While I was down, you know, Andrew Gold, Dr. Das, Jen, Ash, everybody 
we're just holding the fort and now I'm back. We've got so many more plans to increase our content, keep getting great guests. And I just feel blessed to have this, this loving community of people because I probably wouldn't even have my YouTube channel right now if it wasn't for the viewers. So thank you again, viewers. The viewers lobbied YouTube for days on end. It was relentless when I got deplatformed and the channel came back. And I, did, I also thank YouTube as well because having a YouTube channel, it, it's an absolutely life-changing thing. I imagine you've experienced that as well, as well, Steve. Yeah, it's been, look, it's been, a, you know, 2021 was a weird year. There was a lot of infighting, lots of rubbish going on on YouTube, lots of stuff which, you know, I got dragged into, you got dragged into. And I made a promise at the end of December 2021 that I was moving on from all the all the rubbish on YouTube. And and I've kept my promise. And uh, we've seen it again, you know, this, you know, all of this stuff kicking off over the last few days. Completely separate event, YouTube channels going at each other. All I'm interested in is making good content. Sometimes I get great views. Sometimes I don't get great views. I don't mind because I enjoy doing it like you do, Sean. I've got an enthusiasm for doing it. Um, as well as doing this with you, I'm launching for the first time. I'm moving away from true crime and moving away from football. And I'm collaborating with a couple of people um, bringing this show up. Uh, it's going to be once a week. It's going to be on a Thursday night after my football stint with Supermat and Gibbo. It's going to be called Steve Rates News of the World. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to be working with Patricia Devlin and Lee Davies. And the idea behind that show is a simple one. We're going to uh, basically come on. We're both going to have it. We're all going to have a couple of news stories, which we're going to bring to the table. None of us are going to know what on earth anyone's going to talk about. And then we're going to open it up to the viewers. So we could be talking about Boris Johnson. We could be talking about, we could be talking about the cat that strolls around down the street. We could be talking about uh, the price of bananas. We could be talking about anything. Who knows? We could be talking about war in the Ukraine. You know, whether people think it's a good thing or a bad thing, anything could happen. And and, and the chat will take over as well, I'm sure. But I, I've got to be honest, I really enjoyed listening to Lee's stories. I interviewed him on my channel as well. He's a cracking kid. He's a Newcastle fan, which always puts him in good stead with me. And Patricia is a wonderful, wonderful woman. Um, I did some, I did a great interview with her last year. Um, she got me some great publicity in the Irish press for my book, The uh, The Irish Criminal with Brendan Quinn. And um, she's a she's a bubbly, uh, vivacious girl who uh, will who was very intelligent. Who I think will bring a lot to the channel. So I'm looking to collaborate with them on my channel and doing stuff with them. As I say, working with you and and just moving away from the negativity, Sean, because I think I took a lot from you when you said just ignore ignore the ignore the ignore the comments ignore the negative comments ignore the trolls and don't get drawn into things and it's the best advice i could have taken sean because ultimately my life's been a lot better you know since then yeah mine has too and i had to learn the hard way we all get sucked in so what are your book plans then you're a prolific author I took a bit of time off because um, as a Freemason, as you know, um, I've, I've been in the chair again for a second year in a row. Um, and ultimately for me, um, that's been a main focus. And when you're, when you're the worshipful master of your lodge, then there's a hell of a lot to learn. So I've had to spend a lot of time when I've had spare time learning my ritual to do the ceremonies from from my lodge so it's been that's been a lot of the a lot of downtime which I would normally write I've had to spend doing that not for one year but two years um now my time in the chair is coming to an end it means that I can concentrate on learning lines because I've just been cast in a new film called Requiem um I'm filming for a week um in the Cotswolds the Lake District London and um somewhere further down south which i haven't been quite told yet but i've got a week's filming um and it's also going to be the first time behind the camera um i've been asked to go on as a, an assistant director on the film as well so that's a really big break for me um so i'm, I'm going to be I've, I've now got the script i'm going to be learning lines for that but books wise i am going to go back into writing a couple of books um i've been Working on Daryl Laycock's book for about a year and a half. Daryl, as people know, has been on your channel and been on mine. We've had chats. We, we did a documentary with Daryl. Um, you know, he has ups and downs because of the passing of his mother. Uh, but gradually, we've been working on his book. So that is a book that I'm definitely going to bring out. It's a fascinating book um, about his his life, but also the you know the, the Gunchester um, period in, in Manchester, and that that's something I'm really looking forward to getting out. It, it'll take time. We're getting there. Um, I'm bringing a book out with uh, um, Charlie Salvador's first wife. Um, which, which again is a fascinating read. She is she's taken her time. Irene Dunn wrote to write the book herself. We've simply edited that for her, and that's going to be out hopefully, um, you know, towards the summer of this year. 
Um, I'm writing Eric Mason's book. Now, Eric was a part of the Cray firm. And Eric, basically, when he died, left. Well, we were working on his, his final book. Um, we never got it finished. Um, I've been working with it on and off with his son over the last 10 years, but we're, we're getting very close to releasing that. I would imagine that's going to be out at Christmas time. Um, and we've got one or two others in the pipeline. Um, so, yeah, we've got, you know, we've got plenty, plenty in store. Mm -hmm. It's just finding the time to sit down and actually do them, you know. But um, the Daryl Aycock one will definitely happen this year. Uh, Irene's will definitely come out this year. And I'm hoping that we'll get Eric Mason's finished in time for Christmas as well. Fantastic. Good to hear you. You're prolific still. <laughs> yeah, it's great, mate. It's great. And I mean, as I say, it's just all about working together and collaboration and trying to help each other, you know. But, um, you know, and hopefully um, as the clock ticks round, and, you know, get back to do, you know, part three with you and see whether we can beat the four hour, four hour oh epic that we did with you. <laughs> <laughs> Well, listen, it's been a, it's been great, Sean. Uh, you've had a busy day today, mate, and I know you, uh, you're you a busy man. You'll probably be doing another two or three podcasts tomorrow, but I really appreciate you coming on and look forward to joining you next month. Let's have a chat and see who we can get on for the viewers then. Always a great pleasure, Steve. Thanks, everybody, for watching. See you next time. Cheers. Take care. And I'm going to play out with the ads because we didn't put them on during the show. So uh, if you want to watch the ads, keep an eye on now. Take care, Sean. Bye-bye. Thank you.